right? Like these are exploratory. Yeah, for sure. And uh, yeah. I would say that it's less controlled and more likely to cause bleeding than some of the surgeries we do in patients who are anticoagulated. So yeah, so yeah. I, I, I think that's reasonable. Okay, I don't know, Mark, did you want to comment on this or something new or what? what no, um, I just you're next. Say, yeah, okay. I just wanted to say that, and I, I think I understand the protocol, but this is a prospective study, meaning that we recruit the patients when they come in the hospital and we have to get their consent within a certain period of time. Because the only reason I'm bringing this up is because what's holding us up is our ethics committee. And some of it's because of COVID and there's been a lot of delays, but our ethics committee is killing us on this prospective recruitment and and you know, recruiting within 72 hours, and who's going to get how are you going to get consent if the patients cannot uh, are not uh, uh, cannot give consent for you know for obvious reasons because they're 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 incapacitated, and that's where mm -hmm. we're having a very hard time uh, in our center and in Quebec in general. They have these rules about incapacitation and consent, and yeah. And I just wanted to clarify that. So. Um... No, good question. And I'll, I agree, like this can be really tricky and, and, and certainly I'm familiar with Quebec REVs from other types of studies as well. I mean, at the end of the day, this is a low risk study. So it's, it's, it it's is a, a little bit mystifying study. why no there's these issues, study. but they do exist. Um, so if a patient can be essentially a patient who's receiving an anticoagulant, they don't need to be recruited. They don't need to be consented within 72 hours of a surgery. Okay, you can identify these patients retrospectively because all we're, we're really consenting the patient to, a, to a, we're obtaining uh, informed consent chart to review, phone them review. at 30 days. The chart review can happen without consent, right? As a chart review study um, at, at most sites. So the consent is really to phone them at, at 30 days and yes, to provide permission to, to be involved in the study and review their medical records. But uh, so what we've done at, at, in other settings is to say, okay, a patient who is on a warfarin, they have an urgent surgery, you can recruit them after the surgery. Um, if they're incapacitated, you can go back again. Um, and especially in Quebec, where I know there's issues around substitute decision makers making those decisions. Um, yeah, it's huge, yeah. It's huge so it, And so it, the consent can be obtained any time during the hospitalization. So you have that window of opportunity. It doesn't have to be right away. It can be- So the know, consent is later. already for the 30 day phone call, is that what you're saying? Correct, yeah, like pretty much, yeah. And so yeah. therefore you can get consent for up to 30 days. <clears throat> Yeah, so we, you know, we as part of the consent form, we explain the process, which is that we're going to review their, their medical records, but there's no intervention as part of this. We're really just observing what happens to these patients over time during their hospitalization and then up to 30 days after surgery. So you can't call a patient um, for a research study without their consent after discharge. Right. So, but, again, but, but, but in terms of the ethics committee, um, mm -hmm. we can do a chart review without consent, but it's you need the consent for the 30 day phone call. That's correct. Correct. Understand. Correct. So you can do it any time within 30 days, basically. Um, but you would, be, how would you, 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 you would have to get their permission to call them before they get discharged from hospital. Right. Uh, well, not within, yeah, I guess. All right. Yeah. So there's a comment and that's a good comment in the, in the um, chat. Um, about uh, thank you for the comment. If we were if we're waiting for consent, we might lose those who die. A hundred percent, absolutely. So that's why what is what is important is to identify your list of eligible people, um, and we wanted to be able to identify people who come in for urgent surgery who are on an anticoagulant, and those people can be included uh, in the study. Again, we don't need um, can, and we we want to make sure that we're capturing all those patients um, as early as possible, but. You know, given logistical considerations, it can be a bit challenging. They don't have to have had surgery. They just have to be planned for surgery. Um, and, you know, in the surgery, it, it, the patient comes into the emergency room, they're on an anticoagulant, a surgeon comes down and says, you know what, these people need to go to the OR stat, like within eight hours, that person is eligible to participate in the study. You don't have to get consent before the surgery. But yes, ideally, you would want to identify all the patients who are eligible. Um, so we don't miss those people who die for sure. That's a good point. I think I think Terry uh, had her hand up, yep. uh, Deb. Sure, go ahead. Hi, Terry. Hi, Deb. Um, just getting back to Kelly's point about chest tubes, um, the protocol, even the title of the study says, and if you need an urgent surgery or procedure, a chest tube insertion is urgent. Mm -hmm. um, I would think that would be eligible. Yeah, agreed. If um, I, so I. 
Yeah. And we weren't very, again, we're not very prescriptive. So it's a bit, um, and there's a little bit of judgment that's required there. To me, it sounds like a chest tube, um, like a, a chest tube, the way that Kelly described it is, is eligible. You know, we just wanted to avoid, sometimes people call pigtail catheters chest tubes. So, I mean, that's not really mm. um, in, in the, the same level of risk as a, a chest tube like that Kelly has described, you know, which is, you know, a surgery, like a surgical, it is a surgical procedure ultimately. It's just a- and, and- just adding to that, if, if, if patients coming in through eMERGE and they've been in a trauma and they have to insert this chest tube, they might not get consent. It, it can be gotten from the patient later. Correct. Because um, we're, we're, again, we're obtaining yeah. consent, again, mostly to, to phone them after the hospitalization mm-hmm. to see how they're doing, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, right. But I, I think what the important point and, and what's, I think we're, what um, it's important to highlight that identifying the people up front is really important. So being able to capture all the people who are, who are eligible is important and we can follow those people forward. Because as Mark mentioned, you know, we don't need consent to review medical records, um, but we do need consent to follow the, uh, to, to phone people after discharge. Anybody else? Mark, you still had your hand. Is that a residual hand? Or oh, a that's a hand? residual. Sorry. I okay. have to lower it now. I, I don't have a, I'm very good, very bad with Zoom etiquette. It's okay. I never like Zoom, so the, I never We're followed checking. it. Um, and did anybody else have any questions or anything they wanted to talk about or ask about? And, you know, obviously, even if there's not things that we want to mention on the call today, you feel free to reach out to the team. We're happy to communicate with you up there. There's these things that come up. Um, over time. Again, this is an exploratory study. So we're really trying to gather information. Um, and we know that there's going to be a mix and heterogeneity in terms of the types of procedures and types of patients that are included. Um, so I that's okay too. I, I just wanted to just uh, mention, I don't know if we did introductions or I miss, missed them, but usually we'd, it'd be great to have had some kind of, uh, you know, meeting, a luncheon at a conference. We haven't <coughs> been able to do that. If you just wanted to say, uh, if it's okay to say hello and where you're from for the other people that uh, we know who you are, but uh, some of the other sites don't. Um, Just quickly, would that be okay? Yeah, go ahead. Thanks, Joanne. Well, I'll start off. Obviously, I'm Joanne and I'm in Hamilton, Ontario uh, at the Coordinating Centre. And uh, uh, Melanie, if you want to go and Mira, then we'll do the Coordinating Centre first and then we'll go from there. Hi, I'm Melanie. I'm a research assistant working on the study again with uh, from Hamilton, Ontario, working with Joanne. Hi, everyone. Hey, I'm Mira. I'm also a research assistant working here in Hamilton, Ontario, alongside Joanne and Melanie. Nice to meet everyone. And at Michelle. Hi, hi, I'm Michelle. I'm at the Hamilton General. I'm a research nurse working with Dr. Sam Shulman. And Ariona. Hi, it's Ariana. I'm a research assistant working in Hamilton um, at the Jurovinsky site. And Terry? Hi, I'm Terry Schnur. I'm a research coordinator. Um, I work at St. Joe's in Hamilton with Dr. Duquess. And Sam? Hi, uh, Sam Schulman from Hamilton General Hospital, working with Michelle. And uh, Stacy? Oh, I'll go, I'll stay in Hamilton first, you know, Jim, and you, right? Yeah, hi everyone. I'm, uh, <laughs> I work with uh, Terry at St. Joseph's Hospital in Hamilton. Okay, and then we'll go to Deb. <clears throat> you know who Deb is? Hi, I'm Deb. I'm used to being in Hamilton. Now I'm in Ottawa, um, co-PI of the study with Jim. And Joe? Hi everyone, Joe Sear, uh, research coordinator uh, at Ottawa. Um, and I work with Dr. Deb Siegel here. And Vivian, Vivian, how do you say that? That's Vivian. There you uh, go. Vivian, Vivian. Vivian. Yeah. Okay. I work with Dr. Blostein in Montreal. Okay. And uh, Mark? Yeah, Mark Blostein at McGill in Montreal, the Jewish General Hospital. You just met my research coordinator. Yes, I did. Yes, we did. Uh, Maria? Good afternoon. Uh, I am a consultant in the anesthesiology department, and I am working with Professor Arnautoglu and Dr. Vareka. 
Great. And uh, let's see who we've got here. Uh, uh, Metaxia. Hello, hello from Greece. I'm an uh, anesthesiologist. I'm working with Maria and Professor Andamutoglu uh, from the Department in, uh, of Anesthesiology in the University Hospital of Lines. I'm very excited to be here with you. Great to have you here. Okay, uh, Penny Phillips. Hi, I'm the research manager for the hematology group in Ottawa, working with uh, Deb Siegel and Lena Castellucci. That's great. And Beverly? I don't think Beverly has a mic. Oh yeah, Beverly doesn't have the mic. Okay, hi Beverly. <laughs> Beverly, <laughs> uh, it's great to have you here. Um, and you're from North Shore, right? I'm like, okay, did I get it right? I think so. <laughs> no, she's from Henry Ford. Hi, oh, Henry yeah. Ford. hi this okay. is Henry. This uh, is Stacy. Stacy. I Beverly. work with Beverly. Yeah. yeah. From Henry Ford. Yes. Yeah. I don't see North Shore on the phone, but um, let's see, Lori. Oh, Laura. Hi everyone. I'm a research coordinator at uh, London Health Sciences with Dr. Kelly Vogt. And, and uh, Kelly. Hello, I'm a trauma surgeon in London, Ontario. Thrilled to be part of the city. And Melody and Christine. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm Melody. I'm a clinical research coordinator at the Munster mm -hmm. Hospital uh, with Dr. Yanji. Uh, and you're, no, you're, sorry, can you just repeat that? Thank you. I'm at the Munford Hospital in Ottawa. Oh, yes, yes. Well, it's great to put faces to everybody, actually. You know, I think I've built relationships with all of you over the last few years, uh, four years, four or up to six years. And I, I have, you know, seen you, some of you, but not all of you at some meetings. So it's great to really put faces to it. I know it's not the same as being in person, but it, it is really nice to know you're just not out there isolated doing a study. We know who you are and we know we're all working to, uh, working together and it's, it's quite a great network. <laughs> Have I missed anybody? Elena, Elena. Yeah, yeah, hello. Uh, I'm so glad to be here, to be this, a part of this great team. I work with Metaxia and uh, Maria Daluca. And um, we're very happy to be here. Well, it's really great that all of you have joined us. And just uh, before, have I missed anybody else? I think we missed Caitlin. Caitlin? Hi, um, I'm with North Shore. I'm a research coordinator and I work with Dr. Tabor. Oh, that's great, Caitlin. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. It's really, really great to see all of your faces. And thank you for introducing yourself on the, on the spot like that. <laughs> Excellent, thanks Joanne, that was great. Um, so uh, we didn't, you know, we were, we were going to continue the lunch. I don't know if people, you know, feel free to ask questions or make comments. Um, I, I, were there any other questions or issues that people wanted to discuss as a group related to logistics or the protocol or anything else? Any other struggles or queries? Joe, you're unmuted. I don't know if you had a... Oh, no, no sorry. Okay. Seems like, seems like the consensus is no. Um, so I think maybe what, what I had planned to do next um, really was to just have a short discussion about urgent surgery and anticoagulated patients. Um, and I, I thought it would be helpful to do this, you know, for the research coordinators and obviously the, the physicians and, and, and nurses that are involved as well, just to kind of get a sense of why this is an important study um, and what we're hoping to accomplish, like in the context of everything else that we know. Um, and hopefully you'll find it useful. Um, it's just short and you can feel free anytime to raise your hand and ask a question. Um, again, it's really meant to be like an overview of this content area. So maybe I'll just go ahead, unless anybody, Joanne or Jim, anybody else wanted to mention anything at this point? No, Jim is shaking his head. Okay, awesome. Um, okay. 
So um, really interesting area. Um, we know, and uh, you know, some of the surgeons and anesthesiologists in particular on the call can tell us that urgent surgery is really common. Um, and in fact, oral anticoagulants are like warfarin or acenocumerol as Eleni <laughs> uses in, in Greece, or direct oral anticoagulants, which we call DOAX, are really widely prescribed for all kinds of uh, conditions, including preventing and treating blood clots, like ischemic stroke, you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, like pulmonary embolism, deep vein thrombosis, and coronary artery disease. And this will be familiar to some people, maybe not to others. So I just wanted to give you sort of a broad overview. Deb, I'm so but, sorry. You're not yeah. showing your slides. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, that's okay. Thanks. Oh, you hit, somebody disabled the screen sharing. I like how everybody else was polite, just listening along. <laughs> that's okay. Okay, try again. Sorry, right. when I was uh, when we were talking and you finished your talk, I disabled it so we could see okay. each other. Okay. okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. Can you uh, hold on a sec? Are we sharing it now? No. Yes, yes, you are. Oh, you see the the slide with the urgent surgery stuff? Yes. What do you see? Urgent surgery is sorry. Urgent surgery is common. Awesome. Okay. Um, and you see the presentation mode or the other? No presentation, presentation mode. mode. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, you know, lots of people have surgery every year, you know, and this is an estimate, you know, 500 to 800,000 patients. Oh. I think this is North American. Yep. Hello. Sam. Hello. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of people require urgent surgery. So we've got a lot of people on anticoagulants and then a lot of people require urgent surgery. You know, a, a proportion of those, uh, are urgent in nature. So that means they need to happen pretty quickly. Um, I can just tell you that we recently did a systematic review um, with a goal to identify like how common is it actually, if you're a patient, you have a patient and they're on an anticoagulant for one of those diseases and you, you're telling the patient, you know, what are the kinds of complications like you could, they could expect while getting an anticoagulant? Um, we really don't have a lot of data even about how common it is for patients to require urgent surgery and discontinuation of their anticoagulant treatment for it. Um, and so Jim and some others were basically, there's only a couple of published studies where they've looked at this, uh, which is, it's, to me, it seemed quite strange um, that, you know, here we have this very commonly prescribed medication, a common clinical scenario. And in fact, we don't have very much data. So just to kind of set the stage of why we're doing the study and, and why it'll provide important information. Um, oral anticoagulant drugs are uh, prevent and treat thrombosis that we talked about. This is a, just a, a slide that shows the coagulation cascade. And you can see that in red there, um, those, are the, those are the direct oral anticoagulants or DOACs, and they act kind of at the late stages of anticoagulation. And then we have warfarin in blue, and that acts by a different mechanism, and it interferes with the production of some of the coagulation factors uh, in, the, in the pathway. But we know that people who have urgent surgery uh, have worse outcomes than if they have planned surgery. That sort of makes sense. They come in with an emergency type of situation um, and uh, you know, th things are much more acute, they're sicker potentially, but we really have limited data about how these patients are managed and what their outcomes are after surgery. And most of the data that are available are for morphine treated patients, except there is a, that nice cohort study that Jim um, authored from the RELY database, which is really the only study or that, that has some of this information available. Um, and RELY was a randomized trial, which uh, compared to Bigotran and Warfarin for people with atrial fibrillation. Um, so it's important to just have a look here at the table. You can see the outcomes that we're talking about after surgery um, are thrombosis. Uh, and that could be, again, like you know, stroke or uh, pulmonary embolism or deep vein thrombosis, um, major bleeding or death. And you can see, uh, which is pretty obvious here, that the, the rates of those outcomes is much higher in people who need urgent surgery than those who have elective or planned surgery where, you know, you know, the surgery is coming up and you can plan around it. And it, it isn't such a, a, a critical acute illness situation. This is another slide just demonstrating this in a different way. You can see on the left, it, we have uh, elective surgeries and on the top graph, it's the uh, percentage of, you know, people who've, who died. And then the bottom, the percentage of people who had bleeding complications where it contrasts that with the graphs on the right-hand side where you see those bars are much higher. So much higher proportion of people who have urgent, uh, in this case, major non-cardiac surgery um, die and have bleeding complications. So it's surprising that although we have these you know, data sets that show that these outcomes are worse, uh, we don't um, actually have a lot of data about how these patients are managed and what happens to them after surgery. 
And so I wanted to just um, go through a case, which is, this is a fictional case, but it's based on, you know, patients that we see all the time on the thrombosis service and certainly in internal medicine. Um, and, you know, these, this is an 86 year old man who uh, has a mechanical fall and has a hip fracture um, and he needs an urgent OR or surgery. And, you know, he's assessed in the emergency room and he's, he's stable. He has a atrial fibrillation. So he takes rivaroxaban for that. Um, and, you know, his laboratory tests are, are look good. He's, you know, awaiting surgery at this point. So the questions are now, okay, so here we, we know that this is a common clinical scenario. We know that there aren't a lot of data to guide uh, management here, but we know that his outcome is, are, are, you know, not very, he is the high risk of having adverse outcomes. So, you know, it's really important to have this framework in order to understand how best to manage these patients. Um, and these are some of the key questions that we ask ourselves uh, when faced with this type of situation. Can the surgery be delayed? That's always really important to ask. And, and, uh, and you know, this is where I think interdisciplinary approach, and hopefully the surgeons and the anesthesiologists on the call, the internists will appreciate that. Um, this is really helpful to chat with the surgeon to say, you know, when can this be done safely? Can it be delayed? Um, is that reasonable? Now with hip fracture surgery, the orthopedic surgeons will tell you that there is a benefit to early surgery, a mortality benefit. So uh, there is really a, a strong push to get those surgeries done sooner because uh, it improves outcomes for patients. But again, you know, patient is on an anticoagulant. So um, if the surgery can't be delayed, you know, meat has to be done soon, um, can it be conducted safely in a person who's taking anticoagulants? That's always helpful to know. Maybe, you know, there are some surgeries or procedures where, you know, that's a relatively safe thing to do. Again, need to talk to the surgeon about that. Um, if the anticoagulant, if the surgery can't be safely done in an anticoagulated patient, we need to know, well, how much anticoagulant is actually there in the patient right now? Like lots of anticoagulant, a little bit of anticoagulant. Um, what are we looking at, you know, to help us with these decisions? Um, and then finally, whether or not we can give treatments to reverse the effect of the anticoagulant, if those are warranted and if we can give them. Um, and then always to think about when should anticoagulants be resumed, you know, after the surgery, uh, patients are, um, now we've taken away their anticoagulant. They of course are taking these medications because they're at high risk of clots. So we've taken them off their anticoagulants. Now they're sick, they're in hospital. Uh, they've had surgery, which really is a, a highly prothrombotic state. Um, so it's really important to think about putting them back on their treatments when it's safe to do so. I'm just gonna pause to see if anybody has questions or just feel free to raise your hands. Hopefully this is not going by too quickly. I see some nodding. Okay, good. Um, so it's helpful to know, um, again, if we go back to these questions, can the surgery be conducted safely in an anticoagulated patient? Well, how do we know that? Well, it is helpful to chat with your surgeon colleagues, but also to understand that surgeries have different types of bleeding risks. Um, and we can classify these surgeries generally um, into high and low bleed risk procedures. Um, and this is adapted from, from guidelines that have been published, um, but, you know, high bleed risk procedure would be something where there's a two day risk of major bleeding of two to 4%. So that means you know, two to 4% of people would have a major bleed. And importantly here at the top of the list is neuraxial anesthesia. So that means like a spinal um, uh, anesthesia, very important. You know, they're putting a needle in the, in the central nervous system <laughs> in, the, in the spinal canal to, to, in, to give uh, anesthesia. So that's a high, the, it's a procedure where if there's a bleeding complication, there's a high risk of bad outcomes. Um, a major surgery longer than 45 minutes, my understanding, and I'm happy for, for Kelly or other surgeons to correct me, is that's like pretty common for surgeries to last 45 minutes or longer. So I think just in that major surgery category, a lot of those are actually high bleed risk. Um, but things like orthopedic surgery or cardiac surgery, neurosurgery, those are sort of obvious. The things that are less obvious are like renal biopsy and liver biopsy, which can actually, they're very vascular structures. So those can actually bleed quite a bit. Um, and then on the right-hand side, you see lower bleed risk procedures um, where the risk is zero to 2%, you know, some of these other procedures, but I can tell you for the most part, um, surgical, most surgeries uh, require anticoagulant interruption. Um, and, you know, we're, we're really talking uh, very minor procedures like skin biopsies perhaps, or, you know, other very superficial procedures, dent some dental procedures where we don't need to stop anticoagulation, but by and large, we really need to stop anticoagulants for people to have these kinds of surgeries. Um, but in the urgent setting, it's, it's complex because we don't have an opportunity to stop because they're sick and they need to go to the surgery, the OR right away. Um, so this is a really important, I think, point, at least, you know, on the thrombosis service, you know, this is, I think, where we really have value. I 
think this is where we're really, um, you know, adding value a lot here is how much anticoagulant effect is present. And sometimes that's easier to determine than other times. So if you're taking warfarin or you're taking a dose, patients taking warfarin or a DOAC, how do we know how much anticoagulant they actually have on board? I've, you know, I've, I've said to you that it's important to understand the bleeding risk and, you know, that might help determine the timing of the surgery potentially, but, um, you know, how do we know that? Well, warfarin is, or acenocumarol as Eleni uh, uses, uh, can be, the effect can be measured doing a, a blood test called the INR, which most of you are probably familiar with. Um, and what's unfortunate is that for the direct oral anticoagulants or DOACs, the routine coagulation tests are not as good or not very good at measuring the level of the DOAC or even detecting what, what we think is clinically significant or important levels of DOACs. Um, they can be helpful. They can be qualitatively helpful, but you know, um, you, you, they may not change the routine coagulation tests at all, but still have a high level in the bloodstream. So uh, it can be a bit tricky to figure that out if you don't have access to more specialized tests. And I can tell you, um, a lot of places don't have access to specialized tests that are you know, developed specifically to measure DOAC levels. We had them in, they exist in Hamilton and Ottawa, probably in Montreal, I don't know, Mark, if, if they have those tests available um, or at other sites, but even if they're available, they're still, it's a long turnaround time and they're hard to get in the middle of the night when you need them. Um, so it's, it's an issue. So what do we do in the meantime is, well, it's helpful for us to know what type of drug they took, uh, what dose they took and when they took it. That will really help us understand how much drug uh, is left in their body. We also look at things like their kidney and liver function um, because the drugs are cleared by the kidney and the liver. So all of this is kind of a clinical gestalt that we use um, to help us understand you know, how much drug they probably have in their bloodstream. Um, I think Mark, did you unmute and wanna? Say something, or I don't know. No, I no? just pumped about DOAC levels. I think DOAC, we do do DOAC levels at our center. Yeah. Um, and I, we do have a 24 7 rule that you can get them. And the main reason for those levels is for this indication that you mentioned for bleeding or, 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 or the need for urgent uh, intervention. That's the yeah. main role, in my opinion, of, of DOAC levels. And yeah. you so can is that argue. Something? Like, do you, do you, if so, you would like, if you get called about these patients, you would order a DOAC level. Do you get it? If, do you get the level back into, in enough time to help make your decisions? We like, could, usually? we could. I, I set it up so we should be able to. It's, it's, it's done, it's done automatically on the machine. It's a kit based thing anybody can do on a machine. So it's not hard to do. Mm -hmm. um, so we, the experience is we, I usually go with how long it's been since the last DOAC dose and what the surgery is and, you know, various factors. And, Sometimes we use levels. I have to admit, we don't do it that often. It's set up to do that, but we don't actually use it that often. Um, yeah. And uh, I think it's interesting to, because I think the only real reason to do levels is for, for the reasons that you, you know, for your indicate or for these indications. Yeah. So I, yeah. and we can argue what, what is a safe DOAC level, you know? Yes. Is it <laughs> 50 the nanograms per male? Is it 30 nanograms per male? You know, that's, I think that's a little bit controversial. So. It is. I kind of still believe in them, even though I have to be honest with you, practically speaking, I can't say we come across it very often. Uh, we don't use it that much. Jim had his hand up. Jim, I don't know if you wanted to say something. I just wanted to just to supplement uh, the discussion on, on this. Uh, from a research perspective, uh, there are a number of groups that are trying to develop point of care, rapid DOAC uh, tests for this clinical situation, as well as others, like, you know, somebody needing a TPA for a stroke. And I was asking our colleagues in Greece about uh, the DOASense urine-based uh, uh, point of care test, which can tell you if there's a DOAC on board, yes or no. And um, I don't think it's been avail it's available in North America, but it just speaks to the area of interest in this, in this overall Wait, field. Wasn't there a paper recently published on that? I think I saw something about that very recently because in the last week or two like you could well, also yeah, sorry, yeah go ahead jim no no please go ahead Deb. no i i was gonna i was just gonna say that um you know one of the one of the interesting ways that these tests may actually be used in the future is yes in these kinds of scenarios where there's an emergency like either bleeding or um surgery but in order to um direct the use of specific reversal therapies that are that are potentially on the horizon um and are expensive and should be used judiciously. So uh, we may see th this be being used more often for that reason. 
but it's still, there's a real challenge uh, in being able to get these tests in a timely fashion at out sites outside of, you know, tertiary care centers. We, we just don't have these. So, and, and there are efforts underway to, to have point of care testing to be able to do this in real time, you know, at the, at the bedside, but that's not prime time. So, um, but it would be really helpful. This is just a slide to summarize what I, what I had said that you can see with all the X's, <laughs> which means in the, there's the, you could see the DOACs along the top and then some of the coagulation tests along the side. And you can see that, you know, for most of the, those DOACs, uh, we really are, these um, coagulation tests are not very good at detecting levels of drug. Um, and so the, the specialized tests are better, but are not as available. Um, so we can still, you know, again, as Mark had mentioned, this is exactly what we do. We use our clinical gestalt. We can combine some of the results from our coagulation tests. We interpret those uh, in the, you know, in terms of when the patient took their, what they took, when they took it, and what their metabolic function looked like. Um, and that is helpful. And that probably for, uh, to a large extent is how we make our uh, recommendations and decisions in this, in this space. Um, and one of the things that's really important is to know but how fast that, are the- that, So yeah. I don't know if Jim would comment on this. Do you guys use the luck levels in your centers? So we have access, we have a Pixaban and Rivaroxaban levels. That's, that's what we have in Ottawa. Um, in Hamilton, they have more options. Um, we, we, it depends on the situation. Um, sometimes we'll use DOAC levels, for example, um, if, if it's gonna help us make a decision around going for surgery or not, and, and the surgery can sort of be delayed and that, that test will help you in some way if there's uncertainty about those other things, like when they took their last dose, et cetera. But no, by and large, we're making these based on the, cl the clinical information that, uh, that we talked about. Jim, well, at our, at our center, we've kind of expanded the capability to do uh, rapid DOAC testing. Maybe Dr. Schulman or Sam can comment because I haven't requested it. Uh, often, <laughs> you know, you, you don't have the time and exactly. you know, often it, 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 you just go ahead and, and give the reversal agent if you're not sure. Not sure if Sam, if you're still on, if you can... Uh, just provide a perspective from a, a trauma center. It's not on. Okay. Yeah, it, it is something that we, you know, we, 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 we do, and sometimes we do it for academic reasons as well. Um, you know, just in, in terms of, of understanding, you know, a, a, the time course of clearance of the drug and other things, but often, you know, if there's an emergency and the patient's got to go to surgery, you're sort of managing things in real time without that information. And again, it can be helpful if the routine coagulation tests are abnormal, you know, then it's helpful. You know that there's probably clinically significant levels on board. Like, you know that. Um, they're just not, they're not very sensitive. So we, we just are not reassured by normal tests. But if the tests are abnormal, then then that that's what- But, for, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm comforted to know that, because I really tried hard to set it up, but I'm comforted to know that you guys don't really use, you're just, you don't really need to use it very much. Because I set it up, I was all excited, but- I have to be honest with you, I haven't really had to use it very much. Yeah, but it may, if, you know, if, if we end up with an indication for, for you know, a Health Canada approval for Indexinet, um, and it's part of the criteria for administration, it, you'll be happy that you set that up, right? Um, yeah. yeah. So Indexinet is a, is a reversal agent for factor 10 inhibitors that's Are we ever going to get it Canada. here, though? Um, uh, yeah. Uh, maybe. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we are we are going to get it, Mark. We just don't know how much it's going to cost. Million dollars. Yeah. Exactly. Hey, hey Jim, Deb, Scott, Case yeah. joining Light. May I ask Hi. a question? Sure. Hi. Um, for, if you covered this already, I apologize. I joined late. Um, for those of us that don't have dose levels, what's your thoughts on using a low molecular weight anti 10 A assay? And if normal, to be quite confident, there's not important apixaban or rivaroxaban uh, on board. Uh, so again, well, I'll defer oh, ahead, to Jim. Deb or, or Mark or others because I don't, I don't think anybody knows the answer to that question. Uh, all I can say, uh, uh, Scott, and, and, and thank you very much for joining, by the way, uh, is that, you know, the DOAC assays are calibrated specifically to the, the DOAC. So interchanging them with uh, a molecular to heparin, I'm not sure how, how, how that will fly in terms of the sensitivity. I think 
as Deb said, it, it's it's more as if it's not so much a specificity issue, but a sensitivity issue. And but the other the other piece is at what point do you feel like you're safe to proceed and not have to rely on a reversal strategy. So I, I, I don't have any specific, more specific answers to that. Maybe others can chime in perhaps. I think they're not bad as a qualitative uh, test, but like you said, I, I kind of feel, don't feel comfortable making a decision about reversal on that. Although I do think that they have some value in terms of getting a, an idea whether there's a drug on board. But again, it's, I'm not sure it's enough to say whether or not you're going to give a reversal agent. I think you just give it if you really need to give it, if it's clinically indicated. That's the way I look at it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree guess with that. I was, I was more looking, I guess I was more looking at it from a going to uh, urgent surgery. If it was normal, then you had some confidence that you didn't have drug on board. I agree with a qualitative test. Once it's positive, you have no idea if it's positive enough to reverse. Yeah. So I think at the end of the day, though, we're we're still left with you know our clinical gestalt um, because of all of the, because of these issues that we've described. You know, and so if a person has taken a drug, you know, how quickly is that drug cleared from their body is a really important question. This slide just shows that the DOAX, um, and you can see in the bottom row that the half-lives, I, because I'm simple, I like to say 10 to 12 hours for people who have normal livers and kidneys. So it's helpful to think that half of, you know, half-life means that half of the drug is cleared, you know, let's say every um, half of the amount of drug is cleared every 10 to 12 hours. So you can, you know, if you, if you know when they let, took their last dose and you know what the dose was, it's helpful because you can sort of estimate, you know, if they took their dose last three days ago, that's really different than if they took it four hours ago. Um, so clinically, that's very helpful information. And that's what we do in real time. You know, people call us with these. And the first question is, when did they take their last dose? You know, that's really helpful. But, you know, we'd also want to be able to say, okay, for these people who have, you know, emergencies and have anticoagulants and it's not safe to proceed to surgery, ideally, you'd have some way to take that anticoagulant effect and correct it or, you know, remove the drug from the system. And we don't, we, we, we do have some uh, options for some of the drugs, but not for all of them. But urgent surgery, which can't be done safely, is one of the indications for you know, administering a reversal agent. Um, and, uh, but it's really important that we use these reversal agents uh, in the right context and in the right way. Um, not only are they expensive medications, but they are also associated with uh, potential harms. And so um, you know, we wanna reserve them for the people that need them the most. Surgery can't be delayed. The surgery can't be conducted safely on anticoagulation. And we think that anticoagulation is present in significant quantities, or we know that because we've measured it. Um, and that's really the situation where we're administering reversal therapies or procoagulant therapies like PCC. So warfarin is, um, you know, I, uh, warfarin is more straightforward in some ways. Warfarin has a super long half-life, like 36 to 42 hours. So that means like the drug is cleared over long periods of time, sticks around for a while, but we do have ways to reverse the anticoagulant effect pretty quickly. And so the, the de facto reversal strategy is giving people vitamin K. This is a vitamin that's contained in like leafy green vegetables um, for people who, who didn't know that. And uh, you can give it by mouth or you can give it intravenously and it starts to work, you know, intravenously within six hours, kind of 12 to 14 hours is the peak. Um, orally works a little bit less, but again, it, this reestablishes the production of those coagulation factors that are, that are missing. So it takes some time, but you may have a patient where, you know, they need to go for surgery, like within six hours. And so that's not really going to work. Um, so what you need to do is give them vitamin K and something that's much more shorter acting. And what we do is we actually give them back those coagulation factors that are missing uh, in a product, usually um, a concentrate called prothrombin complex concentrate or PCC. You can also use plasma, but, but PCC is preferred. Um, so that's really helpful. And those start to work, those essentially work right away. Um, and they last, you know, um, probably seven hours, six, seven hours until they start to, to, to uh, decrease. Um, we also have a drug called Idarucizumab, which is sort of a mouthful, but this is a specific antidote or reversal agent for dabigatran. Um, and it works really well. Um, and this is just where the result of one of the studies that led to its approval. You can see that in the middle graph, you know, people had an elevated thrombin time that's on the, on the um, y-axis 
And uh, as soon as they gave the idiriucizumab, essentially it normalized that coagulation test. So it really, you know, essentially corrected the abnormal uh, coagulation test or the anticoagulant effect of dibigatran. Fantastic. It works really well. And it lasts, you know, you can see here, it basically lasts for 24 hours. Um, but a lot, a lot of people are on dibigatran these days. I don't know about your site, but at our site, it's, it's, it's not as common for us to see this anymore. But more commonly, we have people on apixaban and rivaroxaban and edoxaban. So what do we do about those factors? And we don't have a specific reversal strategy. We were talking about endoxinet, which is coming um, and is already approved in the United States for folks who are there. But um, we here in Canada and some other places and for some indications, and there's a lot of controversy about this, um, is that uh, coagulation factors are given you know, to kind of overcome uh, the anticoagulant effect of the drug. And we have a lot of uncertainty about you know, whether this works and what harms are associated with it. We don't really know what dose is the right dose, but we do this because we often, we may not have another choice. Um, but it's important, again, if you have a patient who's on one of these drugs, um, that it's just, it's, it's helpful to chat with your surgeon and delay surgery if possible to allow drug clearance in order to you know, increase safety. Um, we don't have reversal agents for these drugs. You can give PCC, but uh, we don't have a lot of evidence that it, that it, um, uh, that it leads to um, improvement in, in hemostasis. We have some cohort studies and Dr. Shulman um, you know, led a couple of those and that's really the, the, the evidence that we have to guide our use of the therapies and in, in, in the studies which were done um, patients got PCC in clinical practice. These people had bleeding um, and uh, most of them, you know, stopped bleeding. Um, and, but there's still, you know, lots of, uh, lots of um, adverse outcomes. A lot of patients died. So these were sick patients. So uh, it's just important to keep that in mind when, when we're administering these treatments. And I often will say, you know, to the surgeons, like this doesn't reverse the, doesn't take away the anticoagulant. The anticoagulant is still there, but it may help promote hemolytics, may help promote clotting. And may help to stop bleeding. Um, and we don't really have a lot of data in the surgical population. There is some guidance um, from the anticoagulation forum and I, it's there, which is helpful, which just sort of reiterates these things um, that, uh, you know, really- Deb, I gotta go. Yeah. So okay. thanks for the talk. It's a very good talk. Oh, I thanks, Mark. Another, I have another run. To, I gotta run to another meeting now. So okay, bye. thanks a lot. Bye-bye. So I just wanted to say, finish off by with this case, and it, I know there's only a couple minutes left, just to say that you know this patient, we, it's an easy out that I've given him, but he took his last dose 36 hours ago, so he's not really you know we're and he's got normal kidneys um, function, so we're not as concerned about him having significant levels of drug on board, um, and he wouldn't be a candidate for a reversal or hemostatic therapy. Um, but also, uh, what's important. Um, is that you know in discussion with the surgeon and anesthesia, this is a person where we would not want to pursue a spinal anesthetic, you know, because we don't really know how much drug he has on board, um, and so that would be something that we would talk about ahead of time as well. Um, and I think that's uh, that's all I really had wanted to to talk about. Um, I'll just leave this slide up, and we can just take some final questions, uh, just to remind people to think about resuming anticoagulants as soon as it's safe to do so after surgery. And uh, anybody, any thought, final thoughts or questions? Joanne's out, look, we can see the palm trees, Joanne. Uh, I just wanted to say it's, it's, it's really, again, wonderful. And I liked this lunch and learn. It, um, I'm, I'm hoping we do this again. And I'm glad everybody attended. And thank you, Deb, for that talk. Yeah, I just like would like to echo those sentiments from Joanne. Thank you very much, everyone, for for attending, uh, for your dedication with the study. Um, we do very much value your your time and, and your collegiality, and we hope this is a small gesture of our appreciation. and And uh, we definitely hope to be able to see you, you know, most if not all of you in person sometime this year. So uh, thank you again very much for attending this afternoon or evening. Thanks, everybody. Everybody, thanks, Deb. Thanks, Jim. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.